This morning's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Matthew, reading verses 13 through 16, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, Roger, for that singing, and thank you, uh, Brother Laverne, for that scripture reading. As you can see, the two are tied together, and the words of Christ there in the Sermon on the Mount, to let our light shine and to remember that we are the salt of the earth. We, as Christians, those of us who have made the decision to become Christians, are to be shining lights. In other words, there's going to be a certain amount of attention that's drawn to us. We're going to stand out to the world. And because we're living the way we're living, sometimes we're going to make the world feel a little comfortable, feel a little uncomfortable, and a little uh, unsure about how it is that they are living. And uh, that is a blessing. That is one of the reasons as to why it is that the Lord has commanded us to live the way we are supposed to live, so that those around us might question and contemplate their lives. And we're going to to dig in to that very topic this morning. In just a few minutes, but before we do, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to promote our men's leadership class. It's going to be coming to a close, the current uh, study that we're studying, but we're going to have to be choosing a new topic of study. And so, uh, books such as maybe this one, Men in the Making. And I know that we have some men here who haven't been attending, and we'd be uh, very honored and encouraged if you'd come. Uh, old or young, it doesn't matter. Uh, we have some older brethren there, and they uh, contribute and, and read Scripture and also offer comments and words of wisdom based upon the experiences that they've gone through in their life. And also we have some younger men there, uh, some men who are even, uh, you know, seven, eight, around that age, and even some four- and five-year-olds who I think are itching and eager to get into that kind of class. And so maybe they'll be able to start coming here soon. And what a blessing it is that our eldership here uh, desires these kinds of classes to be taught so that young men might be able to be trained and brought up, uh, preparing themselves for leadership, uh, not only in the church, but also obviously in the home and throughout the community as well, as they are taught and understand the, the Word of God and their responsibilities. Uh, remember as well that the ladies, they have their uh, ladies class, usually on a monthly basis. And also, the Ladies' Day is going to be coming up on the 21st of September. Uh, Jane Washington will be coming from Henderson, Tennessee to be speaking to the ladies. There's a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer. And so please, ladies, uh, be making plans for that. Hopefully you have uh, come to understand and recognize, not only with those two announcements, but with all the various things that we have going on, the great amount of care and concern that the eldership, uh, Hank, George, and Larry, have for the sheep here, have for this congregation. Uh, we are trying to grow, we are trying to increase and get more and more involved and engaged with one another and with the lost world uh, that is all around us. And so uh, we're going to be meeting on the 7th of September. That is a Saturday, the first Saturday of September as a membership to uh, contemplate ways in which we can get involved in various things that we can do for the calendar year of 2020. Uh, there's going to be a little cookout, and we're going to uh, kind of brainstorm together things that we can do. Uh, if you've picked up a bulletin recently, you've seen we have all kinds of events and things that we've done for the year of 2019. It will be similar along those lines for 2020, but uh, folks, uh, it's not just some random person or group of people deciding these kinds of things. Uh, we are a congregation. Those of us who are Christians, who are members of the Lord's body, uh, you are a part of this local church. And so it's on us then to decide these kinds of things together, to have ownership and actually uh, investment as to what it is we think is best, uh, both for ourselves individually, for our families, uh, for the community, and for one another. And so please make plans uh, to attend that. Again, that is on the 7th of September, where we will be charting out the year 2020 and how it is that we can get uh, involved. Uh, you are the light of the world. Send the light Send the light. What happens when we do that? 
Uh, recently, a young boy is uh, playing in, in football and uh, has a certain church activity, a certain congregational activity that he's going to be engaging in and informs his team that he's not going to be able to make it to a certain game, a certain uh, required event for the team. And the uh, coach responds, the, the, the children, the, the young son responds and says, uh, don't you know that church stuff can come later? Football is far more important. Football should come first. Uh, well, folks, that kind of mindset, that kind of response is not uncommon. As a matter of fact, that's very normal for the world that we live in today, right? In order to grow in character, in order to really understand how to be a man and how to live successfully in this life, we need to invest all of our time, all of our energy in sports. That's the kind of things that we need to be focusing on. Or maybe school, or maybe friendships, or other kinds of things. That's where we need to uh, really pinpoint our attention. Well, what is it that's really occurring in that kind of instance? Those kinds of instances where we raise our hand and we say, Hey, I have a commitment to the Lord. I'm getting involved in something regarding the church of Christ. I'm, I'm dedicating myself to it. And so therefore, I'm not going to be able to wholly and entirely commit my full schedule to whatever it is that you're doing out here from a secular view. Well, folks, in those moments, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for change. It's an opportunity as being a light unto the world for the world to respond and say, hey, we want you to change. We want you to become more like us. See, we think church matters. We think it's relevant. We understand that the Bible is somewhat important, but really we prioritize our life around these kinds of things. So you need to change and become more like us. But at the same time, it's an opportunity for them to change. And obviously, that's the reason why usually they're responding the way that they are is because they recognize, hey, I don't have those kinds of priorities in my life. I don't make the Lord a priority. The Lord isn't my life. I'm not actually committed to the Lord. I'm just a fan of Christianity. It's just interesting to me. And so, I don't know if I want to change. So I'm going to try to see if this person, if this family can change and come along side with me rather than me coming alongside with them. Folks, change is a reality of being a Christian. The question is, are we going to change to become more like the world or are we going to live as lights unto the world and provoke the world to change to become a Christian and to become children of God? Sometimes the church in the past has labeled change agent and the idea of change as just blanketly bad. And folks, the term itself is not a blanket bad term. But what unfortunately has happened in the past is when Christians are met with resistance, when Christians are being the lights that they're supposed to be, and the world then responds the way that the world is going to respond, Folks get uncomfortable about that. They don't like that. They want the world to accept them and, and be their friends. and They want to be cool and to be liked. And so rather than trying to change the world, brethren come back into the church and they try to change the church. Hey church, it's time for you to change. It's time for you to give up the doctrine. It's time for you to stop being faithful to the Lord. It's time for you to get a clue and start living more like the world. Now, folks, that kind, of, that kind of change is a problem. Those type of change agents, that's an issue when it comes to those of us who desire to be faithful to God. But what about when we try to maintain our light? What about when we try to sow seed in a way that it is uncomfortable to the world because of our salty nature as faithful children of God. Are we not changing the world? Now folks, let me ask you a question. Is our society today interested in a revolution? Do we have folks in our society who are interested in, ready, fundamental change? We have people all around us who are so passionate about this in all kinds of different categories. In government, in business, when it comes to food, when it comes to fossil fuels. Let's change the world! 
What greater cause is there in the entire world, the entire history of the world, when it comes to change, than to convert folks to Christ? There isn't one. And that's what true change, that's what meaningful change, that's what purposeful, eternal change is. And that's what really matters. That's why we're all here this morning, right? If you're here this morning to be the same, you're here for the wrong reason. You're here for the wrong reason. If you're here this morning because you want to change your life, you want to live more appropriately, more faithfully, more equipped for the Lord, then you're here for the right reasons. You want to be salt. You want to be light. And folks, that's what the Lord wants you to be. So then, how is it that we're going to do this? How is it that we are going to be agents of change, the right kinds of agents of change? Well, number one, we need commitment. We need commitment. Before we start thinking about the world and trying to change the world, what about us? A lot of people are really interested in, hey, I recognize there are some things out there that need to be done spiritually. I recognize that it's good to help the poor. I recognize that it's good to care for those in need. I recognize all of these things, and I want to be involved in it, but I don't want to change my life. I don't want to commit myself to Christ. I don't actually want to give up what it is that I'm doing and the life that I want to live for me. Well, folks, that means when it comes to eternity, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have a major, major problem problem. Paul explains to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3. In verse 2 he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life, it's right in Christians here, your life is hid with Christ in God. You don't own you anymore. You've given that up to become a Christian. You say, I want to still own me though. I don't want to be giving up things. Well, you don't want to become a Christian then. Folks, that's not me. That's what God tells us. If we still want to hold on to our life, then what we're saying is, I don't want to change for Christ. Now what's the result? Well, the result is, if we want eternal life, where does our life need to be on this earth? It's got to be hid in Christ. Notice what Paul goes on to write in verse 4. When Christ, he emphasizes again, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Folks, it's conditional. How many of us here this morning want to be with Christ in heaven above? How many of us, when it comes to eternity, when it comes to our life being over, physically, it's done, all of our jobs are over, all of our money is spent, all of our homes are rotted. When all of that comes to an end, where do we want to be? Well, folks, if we want to be in eternity with God, then that means the life that we've lived on this earth is not for us. That means the life that we lived on this earth was committed to who? To Christ. It was hidden in Him. And so in order for us, conditionally, to be with Christ in glory, our life has to then be hid in Him. We have to be committed. We ourselves have to change first. Now, commitment's a scary term. Oh, wow. Let me tell you all, brethren, especially you older brethren, when it comes to my generation, this is the uphill battle. Commitment. Why? Let's just cut the cord. I don't want the cord. Don't give me at and I've got to sign off for two and a half years. They're going to charge me X number of dollars. I'm not going to get the channels I want to get. I just want to cut the cord. I don't want commitment. I don't want to sign on over to a cell phone bill that i got to have a three-year contract. I want no contract. I don't want to be committed to a certain relationship. I want to be single until I'm 35 years old, and then maybe I'll think about possibly, eventually, maybe getting married. I don't want to be committed to a boss and do what my boss says and tell you know, and give my life over and my career over to a boss. I want to be able to float around and, and go from here to there and be a freelancer my entire life. Commitment. People are scared to death of it. It's terrifying. I don't want to commit. Well, then you don't want to change when it comes to Christianity. Sure, you can cut the cord. Go ahead and do it. We did it. Cut it. Understandable. 
Sure, you don't want a contract that comes to your cell phone, do it. You want to be a freelancer? Have at it. What a blessing it is. We live in a free country where we live. We have a gig economy where I can be an Uber or Lyft driver and I don't have to commit to anything. I can work when I want to work. That's wonderful. But folks, when it comes to being a Christian, commitment is required. We can't be a Christian unless we are committed. Unless we've said, my life is over here. It's done. It's buried. It's finished. I am now living for the Lord. Now, here's a question. Here's the challenge. Sometimes in this discussion, folks will say, ah, I see what the Bible says. I get it. Okay. I get it. I got to commit. Okay. So I, I'll show up. I'll show up. I don't want to get too close. I kind of ease myself into this. But don't make me actually do anything to really commit. I don't want to actually engage in an action that says it's a hundred percent fact that I'm a Christian because then, then I really am committed. Can I just be committed by just kind of casually when I feel like it interacting with the church? What about those folks in the first century? What about those folks in Colossae? Paul says already, your life is hid in Christ. You're going to appear with Christ in glory when He appears because that's where your life is. Now how is it that they met that condition? How is it that Paul could speak of them in the present tense as being in that kind of position? Well, because in chapter 2, he explains there in verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now what circumcision? Now, some of us already know. Some of us are like, I don't even know what that word is. That's something to do with a hospital and a baby. Just to not get in too much detail for those of you who know what it is, but to describe it, you're cutting off things that you don't want to be there anymore. Okay, That's what the Lord is talking about here. When it comes to your spirituality... You and Colossae have cut off. You've removed those things that are no longer necessary. You've gotten rid of them. What are those things? Sin, a sinful life. You've removed it from your life. Now, folks, a lot of people, again, when it comes to commitment, they'll say, yeah, that sounds good. I, I don't want sin to be on me anymore. I'd like to have that removed. I'd like to have that removed. And so, again, casually, I'll, you know, on occasion, be involved. Wait a second. Verse 12. Buried with Him in baptism. Whoa. How is it that that sinful life, how is it that the consequences of sin was removed from their life? They were buried with Christ in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. If you want to perform the spiritual operation required in order to remove the sin that is affecting your life and that will keep you from an, eternity, uh, an eternal destiny with God, the Bible, not me, the Bible says baptism, baptizo, the Greek word, immersion, full immersion in water is required. You made that decision, Paul says. You decided, you committed to becoming a Christian. And so when we think about change, number one, we're going to change the world. We've got to start changing ourselves. Have I become a Christian? Am I dedicated? Is my life given up so that I can live in Christ? So that I can be devoted to Him? What else are we going to do? What else are we going to think about? What about our character? What about our character? Number one, we need commitment if we're going to change. Number two, if we're going to change the world, we need Christian character. Now, what is Christian character? You know, sometimes folks say, well, if I'm going to become a Christian, that means I'm going to start having to get real serious. Because, you know, religious people, they're really, really serious. 
They take everything really, really seriously. And absolutely, folks, I mean, we know that we have a responsibility when it comes to serious matters. Sin, for example, we just went over it. That's serious. But does that mean our character is of such that our attitude is constantly agitated? Senile? Grumpy? Is that becoming a Christian? You know, a lot of people, they're, they're kind of testing the waters. Hey, hey, they're, they're observing folks. Hey, you know, he, here are these brethren over here who are, claim to be brethren in the Lord, members of the Church of Christ, and, and look at how they're living. Based on the way they're living, could I see myself living that way? Does that make sense? I'm reading my Bible. I'm considering whether or not I want to commit myself to the Lord. I, I'm studying, and I, I recognize that a change is needed, and I need to commit myself, but who am I going to be when I become a Christian? What's going to be my identity? What's my character? How am I going to be defined? These folks over here, they look all grumpy. They look mad. Agitated and upset and irritated about things. I don't want to change to become that. Isn't that what I'm supposed to be trying to get away from? You can understand their confusion. So folks, if we're going to change the world, we have to commit ourselves, but we have to have Christian character. What does that mean? That means we have to be likened unto children. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 18, beginning there in verse 3, He says, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What are the traits about a child? Have you ever seen a grumpy, long-term, systemic, grumpy child? A young child, a toddler. No, usually the toddler's making all of us grumpy, right? We're struggling to just keep our peace. They don't have any problems when it comes to a joyful attitude. Do they respect authority? Well, they challenge it. But at the end of the day, when authority comes down hard, what do they have to do? Submit. Why? They're not in a position of power. They recognize that they are weaker, they are more feeble than the authority, and at the end of the day, that paddle, that belt, that hand hurts. So they better make a change. And they fear the authority when discipline is present. Children have certain attributes, folks, that we as adults have to constantly feast upon. If we're going to have Christian character, we have to look at children and how they behave and how they act and ask ourselves, the way that I'm living my life, those that see me living, my neighbors, my friends, my family members, when they look at me, do they see a child of God? Or do they see a grumpy, stubborn, upset person? Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Christian character. Embodying the idea, the concept, the ideal, the lifestyle of love and forgiveness and charity. As Paul will go on and explain to the brethren in Colossae, in that same chapter, in chapter 3, starting there in verse 5, all the way through verse 14. There are certain behaviors that you need to be completely distant from. You have to mortify from your life. But there are other behaviors that have to absolutely define who you are. If we're going to change the world, we have to, number one, commit. We have to, number two, have Christian character. Christian character to the point where even the outside world looks at us, although they may not even know the Scripture, and they scratch their heads and they say... I don't know what it is about that person, but that's a good person. How do we know that that's one of the ways that we can identify a proper Christian character? Well, in giving the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 2, Paul explains there that a man who desires to be an elder needs to be of good behavior. Then he says in verse 7, that even those that are without actually will provide a good report 
for this brother in Christ, based upon the way in which they live, based upon their lifestyle, they're able to identify, this person's a good person. Folks, having Christian character is a tremendous appeal to the world. That's what makes us lights. That's what makes us the change, change agents we are supposed to be, but we can't just do it one time. We can't just do it one time. You know, a lot of times people say, well, I've done it once. Hey, I've been engaged in worship one time in my life, and so now I can be on my phone on Facebook the rest of my life. I can text message and be on Facebook and ignore worship service and ignore that preacher because I've done it once. Hey, I was kind one time, so I don't ever have to be kind again. I was faithful one time. I had proper language coming out of my mouth, not filthy language one time, so I don't ever have to do that again. I've done it once. The world should know a memo has been sent. I'm finished. Well, folks, that's not a transformed life. Again, going back to commitment, that's not a committed life. God doesn't tell us, hey, do it once and then you're finished. God doesn't tell us, hey, you've hit it one time. Case closed. No, as a matter of fact, Paul explains to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that we are to live transformed lives. Larry brought this out when speaking to the children as they were preparing, going to school, what it meant to be transformed. And I think Navy raised his hand and said, you change from a car into a machine, into a robot. Well, isn't that what transformed is? Isn't that what transformers are? They completely change. You're no longer recognizable as to what it was they once were. Well, folks, when we become Christians, if we're going to change the world, if we're really committed, we're consistent in our character. We're consistent in being a Christian. It's not just, I did it one time, or I'm going to do it on Sunday, or maybe I'll do it occasionally on Wednesday night, or hey, VBS is here, I'll do it during VBS, but then I'm not going to do it. No! I am consistently transformed. I'm a new creature. I've changed who I am. Finally, if we're going to change the world after changing ourselves, we must embody caring. Caring. Jesus, when on the cross, says something that many of us have a difficult time even comprehending. His own people just falsely tried Him beat him, inaccurately accused him, and put him on the cross to die. While on the cross, our Lord could have done a number of things, including save his own life, calling a legion of angels. He could have rebuked them. He could have chastised them. He could have preached unto them. But while on the cross, our Lord, in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, stated, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me ask you a question when you contemplate change. Changing your own life, being committed, Christian character, being consistent. When you start to care for others, do you have a limit Do you have a limit and a point in which you're going to throw in the towel and stop? What do we usually say? We usually say, I've reached my limit. What do we usually say when we say that? We're not saying, unfortunately, I've come to the end of the road from an energy perspective and I'm ready to just go take a nap. Usually when we say that, that's not what we're saying. We're actually saying... I've come to the end of the road and now it's my turn to retaliate. I've reached my limit and now you will experience my utter wrath. Well, folks, when we do that one time, for whatever reason, when we do that, when we have that way of thinking one time, in other words, I have been treated badly enough, long enough, I've reached my limit. Guess what? It's only a matter of time before that limit is reached again. 
and then a shorter amount of time before that limit is reached again. And then an even shorter amount of time and that limit is reached again. And it gets shorter and shorter. Next thing we know, it's completely swallowed us whole. Our limit. We have now given up caring. We have now given up a sacrificial attitude, a sacrificial mindset, an allegiance to the Lord and have stated and thought, you know what? We deserve better. I deserve better. And so retaliation is going to be brought forth immediately. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The world is going to see that. And you know what the world's going to do? The world's going to say, I want nothing to do with that person who claims to be a Christian. I don't want to be associated where they're associated. I don't want to know their philosophy or their ideals concerning life. And especially in this generation, they're well aware of this verse right here, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And they know, although not Christians, they know that that's not how Christians are to behave. Throwing in the towel on faithfulness to the doctrine and on the character of a child of God because we've reached our limit. Folks, the Bible tells us very plainly that change is really, 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 really hard. And it takes a whole lot of dedication and it takes a whole lot of self-control. In the book of wisdom, Proverbs, chapter 25, the writer provides for us in verse 15, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bow. Folks, everyone around us today in this country is a king. Everyone around us today in this country is a prince. If we want to provoke them to change their life, it's not going to be done by having a shouting match with them. It's not going to be done by, quote, reaching our limit. It's not going to be done by putting them in their place. It's going to be done by long forbearing, and it's going to be done with a soft tongue. He goes on to write in verse 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. It is harder to control our spirit than it is to tame any kind of animal. It is hard to have self-control in our dedication to doing what is right. And so the question for us this morning is, number one, have you changed? Have you made a change to your life? If you haven't, if you haven't committed if you've not yet given your life up and actually dedicated yourself to the Lord by doing what it is that He commands, not me, what He commands, then why are you waiting? Everything else you're trying to do for God is in vain. Everything else you're doing, He does not recognize as a substitute for failing to obey His law. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21-23. through 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Done many wonderful works in your name. Then I will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work lawlessness. You're not my child. You're not actually changed. You're not committed. So if you're here this morning and you've not yet committed, why wait? Why wait? Brother, sister, if you're here this morning, you're tempted. You're tempted. You're even thinking about, you know what? The world does all these worldly things. And they don't like me because of it. And I don't say that jokingly. I, I'm, I have pity. I have com compassion. I know what that feels like. They don't like me. They hate me because of the way I'm living. And it makes me feel uncomfortable. And so I'd rather just become more like them. Put a stop to it now. Don't let them change you. Change them. Change them. How? One of the ways is by never giving up on changing yourself and on growing. What a blessing it is that we have this congregation. What a blessing it is that we are a forever family of God. What 
a blessing it is that we have the works that we have going on this year. We have the opportunity to engage in works next year and grow with one another in the Lord. I don't know about you, but I didn't even attend the shower last Sunday. And I got within five feet, and it was like a magnet. Me wanted to just go in there. I don't even like Hogwarts. I don't even know much about Harry Potter, but it looked a lot of fun. As brethren are coming together to serve one another, to love one another, what a blessing that is. What a blessing it is to have one another. And brethren, that's how we stay changed, and that's how we gain the strength to continuously go out and fight the world. And we're appreciative of it. Of it. We love one another for it. As a matter of fact, i got a note here from Julie and Nora. It says, Dear coming family, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone for the wonderful baby shower. By the way, she had one of those shirts on that said, Muggle. You know, I don't know if you know Harry Potter. I had to learn what that was, by the way. The time and effort spent organizing it means so much to me. The girls and I are so blessed to be a part of such a caring and supportive congregation. We love you all. Why wouldn't you want to be committed to the Lord's church? To be a part of the Lord's family. What a blessing to have one another. Brother or sister, if you're falling away from that family, if you know, if you know you're living a double agent life, you're not committed, you're not changed. And you're certainly not influencing change on those around you. Make the change that you need to make to, to, today, this morning, before it's everlasting too late. We'll pray for you. We want to help you in any way that we can. If you have a spiritual need, please come forward. It's all together.